I lugged my suitcase through yet another airport. Amazed that the cheap Christmas decorations here were similar to those at the other two airports I'd seen this week. For some reason, some genius decided it was a great idea to play Christmas songs over the airport sound system. Just listening to fucking Britney Spears whine to Santa about her Christmas wish seemed to depress me even more. One of the wheels on my suitcase was either broken or simply wouldn't roll, so I ended up dragging it more than rolling it. I checked in at the counter and found out that my flight was leaving on time. It was amazing and the best news of the week, which only emphasized how terrible my life was. This is not how my life was supposed to turn out. I'm almost 40, stuck in a job with no prospects, divorced against my will, and on the verge of depression. I haven't been on a date in two months, except for those two nights last week when I fell asleep watching TV with my cat. I really think they should be considered because it is a male cat. This makes him a member of the opposite sex. And he behaves exactly like a man. As soon as we finished eating, he tried to touch me. I was half awake when I noticed that the cat had acquired a very intense gaze and began to rub against my left breast. Okay. I dropped the tuna from my sandwich on her, but he still tried to touch my tits. According to the plan of my life, by this moment, I should have been raising my second ideal child and not dragging around another airport. Holidays are the worst time to fly. I think it's seeing all those happy smiling faces. All these people are going off to meet their families while I'm just trying to feed myself and pay the bills. I notice him from the corner of my eye as I reach into my purse to get my phone. A guy several years younger than me smiles as he approaches me. He's probably about 35. I wish I had taken a mirror instead of my phone to make sure my makeup didn't smear. But damn, he smiles at me. If he didn't like what he saw, he wouldn't smile. Well, maybe he would smile if he was trying to sell me something. I straighten up and look at him as he approaches. He looks good. He has blonde hair. I prefer dark hair on men, but I don't have a choice. In fact, it wasn't until he lit up while looking at me that I started to think I was too old. He slowed down as he approached me, so I smiled. I didn't give him my brightest thousand-watt smile because I didn't want him to think I was desperate or professional. I just gave him a friendly smile. Hi, I said cheerfully when he was within speaking distance. He looked at me strangely and walked past. Once my shock wore off, I noticed that his smile and the way his face lit up were not directed at me at all. Did you miss me? He asked the woman standing right behind me. Mmm, she answered happily. Who is this woman who spoke to you? She asked. The devil knows, he shrugged. Just some weird old airport woman, I guess. Let's go home. I'll show you how much I missed you. I can't wait, she enthused. We might not even make it home. As the happy couple walked away from me, I couldn't help but grit my teeth. I hated that bitch. Then I realized that it was my jealousy that came to the fore. She enjoyed the fact that she had a man who loved her. He loved her so much that separation from her made him yearn to see her again. They will go home and try to compensate for the separation. But it will be more than just that. Their union will be full of joy and sharing, they will literally open up to each other and share their souls. So maybe I was jealous, but I didn't really hate her. In fact, I was once in her shoes, and that's the problem. I knew inside of me what she had, and I would give anything to get it back. The thing that almost made me cross the line and hate her was that, unlike me, she was smart enough to know what she had and appreciate it. After they left, I looked around at the other passengers in the boarding area. Some of them looked at me confused. They probably saw my awkward little performance as it unfolded. Well, I'm really glad that my embarrassment and my very human mistake could bring some happiness or entertainment into their lives. Besides seeing me embarrassed, I'm sure none of them would have given me a second glance. I think I'm approaching the age when women develop their special abilities. It seems that my abilities began to manifest themselves earlier. Women... Over 40, unless they are extremely beautiful, well-built, or rich, everyone gains the ability of invisibility. The only ones immune to our powers are our families. Everyone else can look right at us and simply not see us. When we get that old, young people no longer see us as sex objects, and since they think about sex most of the time, we don't exist. 
Young women don't want to be like us, so we don't exist in their world either. Men our age want younger women, and we don't want men who are much older than us. The funny thing is that if they had a choice, older men, in most cases, would choose younger women if they could get them. The boarding area fills up quickly as the flight's departure time approaches. I pull my briefcase and purse towards me as the seating area becomes increasingly crowded. I think about my family for probably the fourth time this week. What happened to us? After my parents died, we seemed to lose sight of each other. I have a brother and sister somewhere. I don't know their phone numbers or even where they live. Okay, that's not entirely true. My sister lives somewhere in the South, and my brother lives in prison. I'm not sure which one, although I know he'll be there for a very long time. I also have vague memories of some aunts and uncles who are still alive, but I don't even know where to look. I guess what got me thinking about all this was that stupid movie I watched one evening last week while my cat was taking a break from fondling my tuna-smeared breasts. It was one of those movies where the spirit of Christmas gives this guy who almost died trying to save some old lady a wish come true. I'm telling you, it was nonsense. I know most of you think this guy asked for a million dollars, right? Not a million, not a billion, but a damn million dollars, yes. Enough money to buy your own country and buy enough people to live in your country. But no, the guy only wanted one thing. Stop me if you've seen this movie. All he wanted was to have another good Christmas with his family. Like me, his family was scattered everywhere. They had their own lives, careers, kids, and all that normal real-life shit. Over the years, they separated and became strangers. They gathered together only when someone died and then only at a funeral and to decide who and what would get from the property of the deceased relative. I guess in my own way I wondered if things like this ever really happened. And if so, do they ever happen to people like me? Because, you see, what I would like more than anything in the world is to have my own Christmas wish, like that idiot in the movie. And no, I wouldn't waste my money on money either. Don't get me wrong. I don't want world peace. The global economy is already bad enough. We could use a good war to turn things around. And if you think I want to bring my family back together, then you're crazy. This bunch of losers and freeloaders really should stay away from me if they know what's good for them. I can only think of one thing I would like, and strangely enough, I foolishly threw it away myself. Crap. Stupid teenage girls who don't watch where they're going should be killed. This little bitch is as big as me and she just stomped on my foot and kept going. Damn, she's bigger than me. Was my ass this big when I was her age? She didn't even have the manners to apologize. She just walked straight ahead, showing her friend a poster of some little girl that she had bought at the gift shop. Who the hell is Justine Beaver? Oh, this is Justin Bieber, and he's a guy. I remember him now. We had another version of it about three or four years ago. Yeah, only back then his name was Jesse McCarthy. Damn, at least Jesse succeeded. What was the name of this song? Oh yeah, it was called How Do You Sleep. A while ago I played this song over and over again. This helped relieve my problem. But a year has really passed. Anyway, back to my one wish, if I had one wish. I would like to have one chance to get back with my ex. Just like the words in that song. About a year has passed. I didn't see or hear you. I missed you like crazy. How do you sleep? I asked a lot about Jared. I wondered if he ever thought about me. I wondered if he missed me. I wondered if he regretted the fact that he had just destroyed our marriage. If he had to do it all over again, would he give me a second chance? Statistics say that most people feel unhappy after a divorce. I know that I am. But they say that even those who wanted a divorce are unhappy. Eight out of ten people who have gone through a divorce say that if they had it to do over again, they would try harder to save their marriage. I wondered if Jared felt the same way. More than anything, I miss him at night and in the morning when I first wake up. I'm not just talking about sex, although sex with Jared was amazing. More than anything, I miss the person who laid down, hugged me, and held me all night. Nothing else mattered when I was in his arms. Bills didn't matter. Work didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Even on those days when he went for a run and just fell into bed, still sweating, I craved this man's touch. And I know that he loved me. He was a very handsome guy and damn smart. 
but for some reason he loved me. And as in the song, almost exactly a year has passed since I saw him. He didn't even come to court. I never had a chance to explain myself, apologize, or even talk to him. I can still see the expression on his face. That last look haunts me to this day. I looked up as the woman behind the counter announced through a distorted voice over the loudspeaker that I was boarding my flight. Like all the other robots, I limply stumbled into the line forming in front of the door. Despite what you see on TV or hear on the radio, chivalry is dead. Several young people jumped in front of me to get a better place in line. Okay, I know I'm no Jennifer Aniston, but is it so masculine to push past a woman who's struggling with a heavy briefcase and purse? And if you manage to get in line before her, what do you get? The plane will not take off until all passengers are boarded. If you are traveling by coach or economy class, you will not be upgraded because you boarded the plane first. They should have a special reward for idiots like this. Let's call it the DB Trophy. This could be a Heisman Trophy for dorks, dorks, and dorks everywhere. I see it now. We will have the ceremony on ESPN or Fox. The announcer will say, And for hitting a 40-year-old woman dragging her luggage across the boarding line at the airport, the award goes to... Maybe I was just irritated at the thought of spending another holiday season alone. I really shouldn't let things like that bother me. This never happened when I was married. All I could think about was going home to Jared. Of course, I traveled a lot less back then. I only went out on the road when absolutely necessary. Now that I'm divorced, I have no reason to stay at home and be depressed. So I travel more. Then again, maybe since I travel so much, I get more encounters with assholes. As I took my place in line, I saw one of those exceptions. One of those guys who gives us hope. There was a guy about eight spots ahead of me in line who ended up there because he was standing near the door when it opened. He let a woman go ahead who was even older than me. When the young idiot behind him began to complain about this, the guy turned around and glared at him. The young idiot was so shocked that he simply fell silent. I think I was as shocked as the idiot. I felt the strangest tingling sensation running from my legs up my back to the back of my head. The guy who stood up for the assholes was an average-sized guy. It wasn't big by any means, but it wasn't small either. He had brown hair that looked very shiny. His eyes were soft and brown, too. It couldn't be considered love at first sight, since it wasn't the first time I saw him. I saw him hundreds, no, thousands of times, both physically and in my dreams. For some strange reason, it seemed that the spirit of Christmas heard my complaints and responded. My Christmas wish was coming true. The man who stood up for the jerk was my ex-husband, Jared. It was surreal standing just a few feet away from him. On the one hand, I wanted to rush to him and hug him with all my soul. I wanted to tell him that our year apart was over and we could be together again and our lives would be better. I wanted to tell him that I realized what I did and I learned from my mistakes. I not only learned, but also suffered from them, and I will do anything to ensure that this never happens again. On the other hand, I needed to be smarter. I needed to evaluate the situation logically and not just rush into battle thoughtlessly. He probably had some resentment or resentment. He might not be ready to see me or talk to me yet. Looking at him, I saw that he was not the same Jared. But damn, I wasn't the same Audrey either. He's lost weight. I'm not sure if this is good. It was not complete initially. It seems like we both dealt with depression differently. I spent a lot of time lying down and eating chocolate, so I may have gained two or 14 pounds. And maybe my butt has spread out a little and my belly isn't as tight as it used to be. It was never particularly tight but I hadn't gotten to the point where a few weeks of dieting and more exercise couldn't reverse the damage. Jared's depression likely caused him to skip meals because he was too tired or simply didn't feel like cooking. But it wasn't just that he had lost weight. He seemed to be in a different mood. He was always so focused and so energetic. But now he seemed more in control of both himself and the world around him. He seemed to have matured. At the same time, he lost something. Perhaps it was his innocence. I think it was my fault. He trusted me and loved me unconditionally. And I simply turned out to be unworthy of this trust. 
my heart was beating like a drum. Just being so close to him again, my thoughts raced from one possibility to another. This was supposed to be the spirit of Christmas. A little over a year has passed, and I have never seen him or heard from anyone about him. And suddenly, out of nowhere, he appears. It was a sign. I was sure of it. However, I had to be very careful with how I approached him. My reputation was impeccable. I seemed to ruin everything I touched. My life and my marriage were proof of this. I knew that, Christmas wish or not, I would only have one chance at it. As the line began to move and we boarded the plane, luck seemed to be on my side. The flight attendants seemed to be seating everyone according to their tickets. Jared was in business class, as was I. And luckily for me, the idiot and his friends, as well as the old lady, were all in economy class. Jared also seemed to be traveling alone, which gave me another advantage. Chances are no one will sit next to him until all available seats are filled with at least one person. Then the seats next to more attractive people will fill up. The seats next to those who are fat, ugly, smell bad, or just plain weird will be the last to be occupied. Judging by my place in line when I boarded the plane, there should have been still empty seats. I would give up an empty seat to sit next to Jared. As I boarded the plane, I noticed two flight attendants look at Jared and then at each other and nodded. As I walked down the aisle, just as I was about to sink into the seat next to Jared, the 350-pound giant who was three passengers ahead of me sat down next to Jared. I was crushed. I didn't know what to do. I sat down opposite the rising Buddha and seethed. I was beside myself with anger. Why the hell does this fat idiot want to ruin my Christmas wish by sitting next to my husband? I couldn't believe that the spirit of Christmas had arranged this for me, only to have my hopes dashed. Somewhere in the clouds, the spirit of Christmas was probably laughing at me. Then things got worse. A young woman walked down the aisle. Even I noticed her when she boarded the plane. She had long blonde hair and big, giant eyes, and everything else was big, too. Big, obviously fake breasts, a small, high-pitched voice, and a habit of laughing at things that aren't even remotely funny if the person saying them is a man. Even the flight attendants grimaced when she boarded the plane. As she walked down the aisle, I noticed the giant next to Jared stick out his tongue. I smiled at him. He looked embarrassed to have been caught looking at her. I'm surprised you didn't follow her, I said. He just shrugged and looked at me confused. Seriously, I said. Her name is Tina, and she likes guys like big bears. His neck turned in her direction so quickly that I thought his head was going to come off. I've never seen such a big guy move so fast. If the Lions' defensive linemen could move as fast, no quarterback in the NFL would be safe. He carried his huge ass to the back of the plane and fell into the seat next to Barbie so fast it felt like he had been launched from a jet engine. I think his feet only touched the floor a couple of times over that entire distance. God, how angry he will be when he finds out that I knew nothing about this blonde. I quietly settled into the seat next to my ex-husband. He threw his head back and closed his eyes. I don't think he recognized me yet. Perhaps he just didn't see me. I was sure that during the three-hour flight, we would have a chance to talk. All the seats around us filled up and I smiled. I smiled not only because my Christmas wish was on its way to fulfillment, but also because with all the places taken, he wouldn't be able to escape. He looked up as the flight attendants gave us the standard safety briefing and explained how we should behave on board. Finally, they closed the door and the plane began to taxi. Jared took a deep breath. Do I need to hold your hand? I asked. Are you still nervous about takeoffs and landings? His head turned to me and our eyes met. In that moment, I saw him go through recognition, anger, and finally resignation. I'm fine, he said. Then he took out a magazine and began to read. This was a big step. He now knew that I was here and sitting right next to him. He didn't scold me or try to ask one of the flight attendants to change seats. The huge silvery bird on the wings on which we were sitting picked up speed and gradually lifted its mass into the air. Even after all the flights I'd been on, I was still amazed that something so big could get into the air. That moment when we stop rolling and start flying is one of the most amazing events in the world for me. 
This plane, like all the others I've flown, made the transition as smoothly as possible. We climbed and then made a long turn to level off on the course. The captain said a couple of words through the intercom, which I simply did not pay attention to. Flight attendants walked the aisles, greeting everyone and answering questions. We hadn't been in the air for even two minutes, and these fembots were already starting to annoy me. It took all my effort not to yell at them for being so damn funny. Jared, on the other hand, found his journal fascinating. In fact, he didn't even look up from it once. Can we talk? I asked suddenly. His brown eyes looked up from his magazine to me. They examined my face as if they were looking for something. Whatever he wanted to see there, I prayed to God that he would find it. What's the point? He asked. His voice was hidden by neutrality. I had no idea how he felt about talking to me. He could seethe with anger, wince in pain, or simply be completely indifferent. I just couldn't tell. Jar, we never had a chance to talk. Um, after everything, I never had a chance to apologize or explain. I never had a chance to tell you anything. We never got any closure. My therapist says that after the traumatic experience, both parties are in a kind of limbo until they have a chance to come face to face and express their feelings or points of view about what happened to the other party involved. He looked at me as if he didn't understand what I was saying. There was no anger in his gaze, only curiosity. He wasn't trying to offend me. He just couldn't seem to understand why I would want to talk to him or why he would be interested in listening. Interesting, he said. Then he turned back to his magazine. Jared always had a way of annoying me. In this case, he did not engage in conversation with me. I've imagined this moment thousands of times over the past year. There were so many things I wanted to tell him. I rehearsed the answers to all the possible questions that I was sure he would ask. As usual, Jared didn't do what I expected. Not only did he not talk to me, he did not refuse to talk to me. I was ready for him to refuse to talk to me. I had a whole speech or three prepared for this occasion. Two of them started with flat-out lies, just to get him into the conversation. But Jared, by refusing to talk to me, was actually avoiding them all. He was so different from anyone I had ever met. He was smart. He was sexy. And he danced to the beat of a drummer that only he seemed to hear. At the same time, if he loved you, he had no problem pulling you into his world and letting you hear that drummer and even shake a little to his unusual rhythm with him. Damn, how I missed that drummer. When we first met, we were both out of college and deep in our 20s. We both started our careers and were both in between relationships. I met him through a friend of a friend. She wanted him too, but he just never noticed her. Guys always talk about how they hate being in the friend zone. I don't think we women realize it, but sometimes guys will do something completely inappropriate on purpose to get out of the friend zone. The friend zone is hell for a guy. This means that he can do everything in the world for us, but we will still never sleep with him. We treat friend zone guys like girlfriends who happen to have something between their legs. We can meet and absolutely hate other guys. We may think these guys are complete assholes, but these assholes are still more likely to sleep with us than the guys in the friend zone. So sometimes these friend zone guys grab our butts or breasts knowing that they are ruining our friendship just to get out of the friend zone. For them, it's better to be a jerk who might get laid someday than to be stuck and forced to listen to the details of every bad date a woman has been on with no chance of ever getting laid with her. Either way, Connie was in Jared's friend zone. She went to watch football with him, although she did not understand anything about it. While she was at his apartment, she accidentally spilled beer on herself and had to change into something of his. She once told me that she wore one of his t-shirts and nothing underneath for the entire game, and he just didn't make a move. It was very humiliating for her, and there she was, sitting just inches away from him, but Jared didn't even notice. Such things are difficult for girls to bear, so she decided to fight fire with fire. She pretended she wasn't interested in him either. She even went so far as to suggest other women he might be interested in. She wasn't stupid enough to suggest someone more attractive than her or someone he might like more, which is what brought me into the game. She took me to a party she was throwing and introduced me to him. It was a confusing situation because I really wanted to help her. 
but the problem is that the first time I saw him, I wanted him. At that time, I was 26 years old and worked as a secretary. I went on dates often, but didn't find anyone really serious. I wasn't a big deal, but I insisted that my dates take the time to get to know me before we became physically intimate. After we talked and I heard his point of view, I realized that he was even worse than me. He just didn't sleep with women he didn't really feel connected to. If he couldn't imagine marrying you, he simply wouldn't go to bed with you. Looks like we both passed each other's standards because less than two hours after we met, we had sex. It was so good that I didn't care. Sure, I lost Connie as a friend, but to hell with it. It was her own fault. In a way, Connie insulted me. She only introduced me to Jared because she thought she was prettier than me. She also thought she had a better figure, and she thought I had no chance with him. It was her loss and her fault. I still laugh sometimes thinking about how she must have felt after introducing us to that party, only to see us leave shortly after. She must have felt very bad leaving her guests to follow us to my apartment. She waited outside for over four hours until he left so she could come up to my apartment and confront me. I opened the door, thinking he had forgotten something. I didn't even bother getting dressed. I still had bite marks on my neck. She looked at me, burst into tears, and then called me every possible insulting word she could think of. You are not as beautiful as me, she cried. I just nodded my head. Your breasts are too small and your ass is too big, she screamed. I nodded my head again. You're a slut. You slept with him on the first date. You didn't even go on a date. Again, all I could do was nod my head in agreement with her. What do you have that I don't? She cried. I slammed the door in her face and ended five years of friendship. But it was also the beginning of my relationship and eventual marriage with Jared. He was and remains the love of my life. In my first few weeks with Jared, I quickly learned what true love was. We spent almost every possible second together. We spent a lot of time in bed, but also took time to get to know each other better. Our tastes, dislikes, and personality traits. There were many days when we went to bed together and did not have sex. We just lay there, touching each other. After our wedding, things became even more intense. Jared was obsessed with making our lives together better. He tried his best to make me happy and keep me happy. We saved every penny we could to buy our house. The plan was that we would begin preparing for our future genetically perfect children. I noticed after some time that Jared, even though we didn't have much money beyond what we needed and little we could save each week, had a double standard. Jared denied himself even the smallest things, but he always spent money on everything I wanted. I didn't understand what he was doing until he even drove his Mustang once in the summer. This way, he told me, he could save the full cost of his absurdly high car insurance. He could also save on increased gas costs for his powerful engine. I left him shaking my head as I realized that just a week ago, he had taken me out to dinner at a very expensive restaurant. I wanted to try and bought me three new outfits that I had to admit I didn't really need. It began to dawn on me that this man loved me. He didn't marry me simply because he liked having sex with me. He really wanted me to be with him all his life. He was going to be more than just a father to my children. Jared was the missing piece of my soul. I applied for and received a position as a sales trainee at work. Six months later, I became a full-time salesperson. I had and I struggled with bills and everything. I noticed that my sales weren't as high as some guys. I thought it was because of long-term relationships with their clients or other factors like that. I sometimes listened to senior salespeople. I noticed that they all had ways to sweeten their deals. Some of them invited their clients to parties or barbecues. Others played golf or invited their clients to gamble. But all these guys got the best accounts and the highest sales figures and the best bonuses. I think it was about four years ago. I was a salesperson for about three years. One of my best clients was Mick Fleetwood. Mick was one of my first clients, but he still only gave me small sales. Sometimes he would turn to other sellers for his big purchases, even though he was technically my client. Mick was 68 years old and in poor health. His wife died a couple of years ago and I attended her funeral. I thought our relationship was such that I could ask him anything, so I asked. I asked him why he gave me all his regular day-to-day -day small jobs, 
but left his big car purchases to John McVie or even Lindsey Buckingham. He told me that these guys found a way to sweeten the deal for the girls. I desperately needed a bonus to stay on the sales team. I really needed to do my part to help Jared save money on our house. That's why I slept with Mick. I didn't really consider it sex. He was 68 years old. Even with Viagra, he could only last about 10 minutes. There was also the fact that no man in the world could compare to Jared when it came to sex. We were so perfect for each other. We matched so well, and I loved him so much. It was simply impossible to compare him to anyone else. After a couple of bonuses, the extra income really helped us. After a while, we bought our house, and it really seemed like we were doing well. Jared had several promotions at work and was now making a lot more money. We traded his Mustang for a new and better Mustang. I also got a new car. We still saved money, but it was more like a rainy day fund. Finally, we started talking about me quitting my job so we could start having kids. We decided that I would finish the year and then give notice early next year. I was in Chicago for dinner with one of my biggest clients. I wanted to end on a high note. I wanted to win the prize for the highest salesperson for the quarter. I had come close a few times before, but neither I nor any other female salesperson in the company had ever won it. After dinner, I returned to my hotel room with the client. I lay there imagining that the 60-year-old man making love to me was Jared, and we were trying to conceive. This is how I dealt with sex. I just closed my eyes and imagined it was Jared. Of course, it was never as good as it was with Jared. But your mind can do wonders. Only for the last time did something tell me to open my eyes. I did it, and my world collapsed. As soon as my eyes focused, said, I noticed Jared standing in the open door with several of my co-workers and my boss. He had tears on his cheeks. No, I screamed. Goodbye, Audrey, Jared said. I loved you. The reactions of the men who were still in the room as I tried to get dressed and follow Jared varied. My boss was furious. He stood there, turning redder and redder like an old steam boiler. He was turning over the facts in his head, almost as if he was building up steam before an explosion. The laughing expressions on my colleagues' faces were also different. I've heard everything from, I knew she had a reason why she outsold me, to, hey, we all have our own ways of closing a deal. Harvey smiled and exchanged high fives with the guys. His newfound macho reputation far outweighed any possible damage to his marriage. When I finished cleaning myself up and packing my things into my suitcase, I noticed that all the guys except my boss Darren had left. The pain and despair I felt finally found a way out. They came out in the form of long, painful moans and sobs. I couldn't stop crying no matter what I did. Darren tried to explain to me how they got here. There was no surveillance of me, there was no investigation. Darren found out that I had already won the prize for best salesman on the block. He called me to tell me about this and forgot that I was on a business trip. When he told Jared about the award, Jared admitted that this would probably be my last deployment as we were about to start our family. Both Darren and Jared thought it would be a great idea to surprise me with a cake and a small ceremony. Only they were surprised. He told me that it might be worth giving Jared some time to get over the shock before trying to talk to him. Darren has been married and divorced three times. Wife number four seemed like the one who would finally stay. He's been through it all and seen it all. He even went through this once. He tried to explain to me how Jared might have felt, or something similar, since every person is different. He told me that tomorrow would be soon enough to try and talk to Jared. He told me that I needed to prepare my story and be prepared to be humiliated. He told me that it would probably take a while, but that Jared and I loved each other, so he thought that if we tried, we could get through it. He also told me that I was fired. As soon as I finished packing, I checked out and headed to the airport. My flight was not scheduled to depart until the next day in the afternoon. I missed the last flight that day by less than half an hour. Unfortunately, Jared was on it. When I got back to the hotel, Harvey was sitting and drinking with the guys. I didn't go near them. I stayed in my room, crying, and trying to call Jared. 
he never answered or called me back. My avoidance of the guys did not stop them from trying to come up to my room. I was no longer a colleague in their eyes. I was just a slut. There were no more workplace rules to get in their way. When I flew out the next day, I spent the entire night preparing for my confrontation with Jared. I was ready to get on my knees and kiss his ass or whatever else he wanted. I expected him to change the garage's locks and codes. I tried to drive into the garage first. My remote worked on the first try. I realized then that no matter how angry he was, it wasn't the end if he still allowed me access to the garage where his precious Mustang was stored for the winter. When the garage opened, my despair deepened. Not only was Jared's Mustang cleaned up, which was unprecedented in the middle of winter with snow on the ground, which was absolutely incredible. My car was in the garage. Many of you may not understand what this means. Jared's car has never even seen snow. It's never even seen rain. Jared only drove this car in the summer on completely dry days. The underbody of this car and everything else was still like new. The car has never been washed in a car wash. He lovingly washed the car every three days, all summer, no matter what. She slept all winter in the heated garage and he still washed her to remove dust even though she was covered. The only meaning of this message was one. He left me. Jared was gone and he had no intention of coming back. I collapsed, crying in the garage over and over again. As I sat there sobbing, a UPS truck pulled up to the house. The driver came down and handed me a large package. She wasn't heavy. I signed for the package, and the driver cheerfully wished me Merry Christmas and drove away. I knew what was in the box. It was one of Jared's Christmas gifts. I bought him a suede and leather jacket with Mustang emblems all over it so he could remember the stupid car even when he couldn't drive it. I noticed a lot of garbage accumulated in front of the house. I ignored it as I walked to the door and tried my key. It still worked, of course. I didn't know what to expect when I entered the house. I thought maybe Jared had gone crazy and damaged a lot of our stuff and messed up the house. I knew things could be replaced, so I was ready. But Jared changed the house in ways I never expected. There wasn't a single thing out of place. Unlike usual when I travel, this time the house was as neat as a pin. As I walked from room to room, I noticed that he didn't take anything, or at least not much. All his belongings were gone, as were most of his tools. He took every photo of himself and every photo of us together and just cut himself out of them and replaced them with frames. If I expected to be able to burn off nervous energy by cleaning while I waited for him to contact me, I was disappointed because there was nothing to do. It took me a while to understand what Jared had done. He literally destroyed our house without trying to do any damage. He turned our house into just another house by simply taking all the love out of it. Walking through that house, instead of seeing all the wonderful memories we built there and all the hopes and dreams of what we still wanted to do there, I now only saw a big empty box to hold all my stuff. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity squared, the phone rang. It was Mary, our housemate. She said she saw a light in the house and thought I was back. I thought I'd tell her that Jared left me. Perhaps she will come to make me coffee and comfort me. She had actually called to rescind her invitation to the party they were having on Saturday of Christmas Day. She called me a few selective names and said that I deserved everything that happened to me. Apparently, she was talking to Jared. Surprisingly, he asked her to look after me and told her that I would need a friend. I fell asleep on the couch after drinking too much alcohol. The next morning, I woke up with a terrible hangover. I hadn't seen or heard from Jared in over 36 hours and I felt terrible. I wonder why he didn't call to scold me and call me bad names. Did he want to yell at me or at least ask why I did it? That evening, the doorbell rang late. I jumped up from the couch and ran to the door. Opening it, I noticed a bored girl on the porch. She chewed gum and looked at the list. She read my name from the list. When I confirmed my identity, the little bastard said, Merry Christmas, you've been served. She handed me a thick folder of documents and grinned at me. Then she walked away, still chewing her damn gum, not caring about anything in the world. I opened the folder. Never in my wildest dreams would I have expected this, especially so quickly. 
These were divorce papers. Jared asked for a divorce without mutual claims. He wanted to split everything in half. He's already taken half of our checking and savings accounts. He liquidated our investment and was due to send me a check soon. He also removed himself from my 401k plan and sent me paperwork to remove me from his. He generously filed a quitclaim deed for our home and gave it to me. He kept his car and Jeep. I kept my car. If I sign this, the divorce will be final in 60 days. I will never let him go in my life. I was going to hire a lawyer and demand my day in court. I wanted to fight for my marriage with all the strength I had left. I won't let Jared out of my life without trying to keep him. In the end, everything took 75 days instead of 60. You'd expect to hear that I fought to see him or get a consultation, right? None of this happened. Even my lawyer admitted that Jared was more than fair. By rights, he should have forced me to sell the house and split the proceeds with him. I think that, in a way, giving me the house was Jared's way of making me suffer even more by making me remember all the plans we had for our lives. I sat there alone in this house, and it was torture. Everything I saw reminded me of what I had lost. Jared is the kind of person whose absence is felt by everyone who knows him. So my neighbors wasted no time in letting me know how they felt. Less than a week after Jared left, I began to feel like a small island in the middle of a huge lake. I was completely isolated among people I once considered my friends. There was also the fact that I really couldn't afford a mortgage without him and would have to take a loss trying to refinance it, so I sold it anyway, and for much less than it was worth. I found another job and started trying to get back up the career ladder. The problem is that it's really hard to find motivation when you just don't care. The new work was also in sales. I didn't really try for the first few months, so I didn't make much money. I noticed that my savings were disappearing at an alarming rate. The cost of my therapy sessions was also killing my budget. My new job didn't have an employee retirement plan, so I really needed to stop losing money from my savings account. Therapy didn't help. I already knew where I went wrong. I already knew what I had lost. I actually lost a part of myself. I gave up part of my soul, and only by returning it can I become whole again. So now, a year later, I'm fatter, less attractive, and more depressed. I made a wish, and it seems to be starting to come true, but apparently I'll have to work a little harder to make it come true. But that doesn't bother me because all I wanted was a chance. Jared sits next to me. He is like a life preserver in the middle of a very stormy sea, and I am a drowning woman. There's no way I'm letting him leave again. While we were apart, I did my best to keep an eye on Jared. I started friendships and reconnected with people only to find out how he was doing. Part of this required me to humiliate myself and swallow a lot of nasty things. Remember that bitch Connie? She was the stupid one who gave Jared to me the first time. Connie called me about a week after Jared left me. She couldn't wait to make fun of me. I had to listen to her basically call me worthless. I warned him about you from the very beginning, she said hoarsely. You just weren't right for him. You gave yourself to him within minutes of meeting him, remember? After 20 minutes of conversation, I finally got what I was waiting for. He's really not feeling well, she said. You hurt him very much. I tried everything possible to get him to leave the apartment. I even tried to come visit him, but he didn't want to see anyone. Thanks to my patience and her chatty nature, I had all the information I needed. I knew Jared had moved into an apartment. I also knew that he wasn't trying to date anyone and that he was having as much trouble being separated from me as I was from him. I learned other news from other sources, but Connie was always the one I could turn to when I absolutely needed to know something. She liked to let me know that she knew more about my husband than I did. She liked to brag that I was unlikely to end up with him. Unfortunately, after some time, all my information about Jared dried up. Nobody knew anything about him. Even Connie admitted that she knew nothing about his life. I would pay for any little information about how he is feeling or what he is doing. And then, suddenly, he appears... And besides looking a little thinner and more serious, he actually looks good. The time apart was obviously a lot kinder to Jared than it was to me. 
Maybe it's because he has a clear conscience while I bear the blame for the end of our marriage. I looked back at my ex-husband as the plane continued to cut through the air, reducing the distance between us and our destination by miles every second. It seemed to me that, watching him from the corner of my eye, our time was slipping away, and with it any opportunity to return it. How do you sleep? I asked him suddenly. What? He asked. I even thought I saw the beginning of a smile on his lips. Audrey, you always knew how to ask me the most unexpected questions, he said. This is one of the qualities that I loved most about you, and probably one of the ones I missed most. I had a hard time concentrating when he said that. Jared obviously didn't understand how his words made me almost faint. I was starting to feel the magic of the Christmas spirit working in my favor. Perhaps I will succeed. He turned in his chair and actually looked at me. His smile lit up my whole world. Everything was going so well until one of those little plastic flight attendants came into the picture. She asked him if he wanted something to drink. Okay, I know you think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. This bitch was in the way. Why do I think this? Let's look at the situation. We are both flying business class. We both have the same privileges and amenities. She comes over and leans over me, giving him an unobstructed view of her cleavage to see if he wants a drink. Wouldn't the proper procedure be to ask both of us if we'd like a drink? And was it necessary to lean over me and shove my breasts in his face? This bitch did it long before they even had the drinks cart ready for the rounds. She saw Jared and I talking. She didn't know that we already had history together. She saw him turn in his chair and smile at me. She just decided right then and there to ruin my mess. Luckily, it didn't work. Jared just smiled at her and said he'd wait for the cart to come over to see what they had. She told him that she asked him earlier in case he wanted something special or something that wasn't on the menu. I asked her if everyone gets this opportunity and she just smiled and walked away without answering. So tell me, did I overestimate the situation? I probably didn't expect to see you again, he said, changing the subject and talking to me as if we had never stopped. But then I didn't expect anything of what happened. It was like a kick in the teeth. I think in a way it was my fault. See, when I met you, I thought my life was settled. I never imagined that you and I wouldn't be together forever. I didn't think so either, I said. I saw a little anger on his face and he hid it well. That's another thing about Jared. I've never seen him lose patience, not once in all the time we were together. So even this outburst of negative emotions spoke volumes about what he had gone through to get me through. Jared, I love you so much that it hurts to be without you, I said. I feel like part of my soul is gone. I had to sell the house. I couldn't bear to be there with the ghosts of us constantly reminding us that we were broken. None of our neighbors spoke to me. I became an exile. I tried therapy. It didn't help. Nothing worked, Jared. It was like I died and no one told me. I was just wandering around, going through the motions of life, not realizing that I was simply no longer alive. As I said this, a single tear rolled down my cheek. I tried so hard to control myself. I really thought I'd cried about it already, but finally, having the chance to talk about it with someone who actually mattered, all those old emotions came up again. Jared handed me a handkerchief. Damn it. It wasn't a tissue or a wet wipe or anything like that. It was a real, very good scarf. Where the hell could he get something like that in this day and age? Okay, he said. I see it from your point of view. We're having a chance meeting. We haven't spoken to each other since this happened. So, you see this as an opportunity for, what, closure? His gaze swept over my face, and I felt as if every emotion I had suppressed all my hopes and dreams were exposed to him. I looked down and was rewarded. The plane's floor was carpeted. It was good because if he had told me to get on my knees and beg him, I would have done it. So, okay, Audrey, we're having this conversation. You're getting the closure your therapist said you needed. What's in it for me? It was unusual. Jared had never done anything for his own gain before. I started to see what I had done to him. The changes in him were much deeper, and at the same time much more subtle than I thought. 
What do you want, Jared? I asked in a quiet voice. I hoped against hope that he would tell me that he wanted me back. Do you understand what you did to me? He asked, mockingly. When he asked the question, I realized that I was remembering memories and emotions that he never wanted to remember again. He buried them, so he wouldn't have to deal with them. Before we can move on, we'll have to open this box and take a look at some really ugly things. I had a feeling there would be some anger and some resentment, but I was willing to face it if he was ready too. His voice was loud enough to make both flight attendants turn in our direction. I could see the concern on their faces as they looked at him. The looks they gave me were much less caring. You were my only world, he blurted out. Do you have any idea how long I've been looking for you? Do you have any idea how special you were to me? Every woman I've dated before you always looked like Connie. All they cared about was how they looked. The only thing was, what they cared about in men could be boiled down to an equation with three variables. It was like fucking romantic algebra. The first factor is what the guy looks like. The second factor is how much money he makes or has. The third factor is what his size is. You add these up three and you get a grade. If a guy is lacking in one but is above average in the other two, he can still qualify. My mouth fell open. Not because I was shocked, but because he put it so succinctly. He made it sound so simple and so materialistic, but it was the deep truth. Don't you think it's humiliating to judge a person's worth or suitability as a partner based on just three variables? He asked. Even those guys who try to sleep with every woman they meet have higher standards for those they actually intend to marry. That's one of the reasons I've never run around trying to sleep with every woman I've dated. Access. I knew I could never be with someone like Connie. She's sweet and all. But on a deeper level, we just didn't mesh. So why would I waste time on her? When I met you, it was different. I'm not saying you weren't beautiful because you were but you had qualities that Connie didn't have. I felt physically attracted to you. My mind and my heart told me that you were the one. Within minutes of our meeting, I just knew it. Hearing that from him now made me want to open the door of that damn plane and just scream with happiness. Of course, if I did that, the plane would depressurize and crash to the ground, killing all the passengers, including Jared and me. The only thing that would probably survive intact would be the inflating airbags filling that damn flight attendant's chest. Audrey, Connie told me so much about my decision to be with you, she convinced me for months that you would do something like what you did. I never believed her. That's one of the reasons we are no longer friends. After, well, after what happened between us, she tried to help me get over it, but she wasn't really a friend. All she did was try to rub it in my face that she warned me about you, and she kept trying to convince me that the answer to my problems was to contact her. A friend doesn't try to force you to do something you're just not ready for, so Connie and I are no longer friends. Audrey, I was depressed and completely broken. I didn't leave the house at all for a long time. It was over a month before I went back to work. I was just devastated. Think about it. The woman I loved, with whom I... It seemed like I was sharing my life and soul, going and sleeping with other guys. I found you with a guy who was twice my age. I closed my eyes and tried to turn away from him. He didn't let me. He reached out and gently grabbed my face, forcing me to look at him again. And Audrey, what hurt me even more was that you liked it better than with me, he said. Both of our thoughts were exposed, along with our emotions. I apparently cried then and there, and there was moisture in the corners of Jared's eyes, too. Would you both like to order a drink? Flight attendant Barbie began before we both interrupted her. No! We both shouted at the same time. Our response was much harsher than we wanted. Everyone around noticed this and looked at us. We'll land in about an hour, the flight attendant said, wheeling her cart toward the next row of passengers. Quieterly, but with an angrier tone, I spoke to Jared again. What the hell makes you think I liked it better with him? I asked. Jared, you're an asshole. No one has ever been better than you. No one has ever even been as good as you. What fucking logic do you base this nonsense on? Audrey, 
he said quietly. I saw that it was really hard for him. Even after all this time, he suffered just as much as I did, maybe even more. It was what you said. Jared, are you crazy? I asked him. I looked at him thinking that he was joking or speaking ironically. When I looked deep into those beautiful brown eyes, there was no hint of deception. Jared truly believed what he heard that day. Jared, when I was with these guys, it was never about love or sex. I got all the love I needed and all the sex I needed from you. When I was with them, the only way to get through this, closing my ears and imagining that I was having sex with you. So I pretended it was you that day. It was the only way to get some kind of reaction out of me. Having sex with you was so much more than just a physical act. None of them even came close to this. Jared's face changed again. I don't know why I expected him to be happy after hearing this, but he was far from happy. It was an explosion of pain. Perhaps Jared's emotions were like a group of chemicals placed on shelves in his psyche. My answers to his questions brought out some of those emotions, and it's clear that some of these substances should never have been mixed. Then why the hell did you do it? He shouted. Jared's scream sounded like a bomb going off in the cramped space of the plane. Not only the flight attendants, but also two men at opposite ends of the plane stood up and stared at us. I think we now know who the air marshals are. The flight attendants and one of the men approached us. Sir, said the man, is there a problem? Maybe we should move you to other seats? It's my fault, I said. The man looked at me in disbelief. We just need some privacy. We'll be quiet. The man looked at us suspiciously. He's my ex-husband, I said. We haven't talked to each other since the divorce started. Maybe if we had a chance to talk then, things would be different now. I think he didn't expect some of my answers to his questions. He's in a terrible situation. When we get off this plane, we may never see each other again. We'll be quiet. He shook his head but returned to his seat. Jared, it was never about me being unhappy with you. You were always more than enough for me. I loved you 100%. We had no problems between us. The problem was me. You always treated me like gold to me. Even when we didn't have a damn money, you drained our savings to buy me something I didn't really need, while you went without everything. I just had to try to make a greater contribution to our finances. I wanted to help. I know it was stupid. I know it was wrong. But that money really helped us. It took some of the financial pressure off of us, and we got our house much sooner than we otherwise would have. It's nothing to us. It wasn't worth it. And we came back. Jared raised his hand to silence me. He turned away from me and started looking at something on his damn iPhone. Jared, I said quietly and patted his shoulder. He pulled away from me again. Audrey, can you please leave me alone for a while? He asked. I need to process this. A few minutes later, I saw Jared take out a notepad and start writing something. I looked straight ahead. A few minutes later, a flight attendant walked by. I grabbed her hand before she got too far away from me. She looked at me as if I had done something terrible by touching her. Can I have my drink now? I asked as nicely as possible. Sorry, she began, but... Damn it, if you don't bring me a drink, you'll wish you didn't, I said as coldly as I could. She nodded her head and returned a few minutes later with a selection of those little drink bottles. I took three bottles of vodka. You should probably pour them into a glass she said, and we'll land soon. I nodded and took the glass she offered. I leaned back in my chair and looked around. Most of the passengers around me, who were not busy looking out the window or talking to each other, were looking at me. I really wanted to stand up and scream, Boo! as loud as possible. Jared continued to write something on that notepad. It looked like a man trying to write War and Peace in ten minutes on a legal pad. He didn't even give me a glance and there were so many things I wanted to tell him. Just before the plane began to descend, he stood up and went to talk to the flight attendant. He took his jacket and briefcase with him. To the toilet, he said over his shoulder as he left. I saw a conversation between him and the flight attendant and air marshal, and then I saw him walk further into the plane. After a few moments, airplane Barbie returned and began asking everyone to put down tables and anything that wasn't secured. We were about to land. I grabbed her shoulder again and asked about Jared. 
She said he was still in the toilet, but not to worry. He'll be fine if he stays there during landing. I didn't care if it fell into the miniature toilet if that's what she meant. I was worried about our unfinished conversation. At this point, my Christmas wish did not come true. There was so much more we needed to say to each other. Where are we? Are we going to get back together? Are we going to try to be friends? God, I needed this man in my life. It was time to pick up the pieces and move forward with our lives. I still had a hard time dealing with all the pain and suffering he carried within me. I mean, I guess I always knew I loved Jared, but it was such a surprise for me to hear what he said and to know the true depth of love he had for me. I just never thought that a man could love any woman so much, especially me. I just couldn't stop turning it over and over in my mind. He really loved me. Me, simple, ordinary Audrey. My betrayal hurt him far more than I ever suspected. All this time I thought that I was the one who was suffering. Maybe our reunion will be good for both of us. The spirit of Christmas helped two people, not just one. The plane landed exactly on schedule. I looked past Jared's window and watched the ground get closer as we landed. In the parking lot, as we flew over it, I thought I saw Jared's Mustang GT. Next to me, this car was the only thing he loved. When the plane stopped, the passengers, who were in such a hurry to take their seats, again became impatient and hurriedly began to get off. Jared still hadn't returned from the bathroom, and I had so much more to tell him. Perhaps we could continue our conversation over dinner. I remained in my seat until all passengers had left the plane. When the last person left, the flight attendant approached me. You need to leave the plane now, ma'am, she said. I couldn't believe this bitch dared to call me ma'am. She acted like I was an old lady, or like I was slow. I'm waiting for my friend from the toilet, I said. She looked at me with a really worried expression and sat down next to me. Damn, she really seemed to care. He never went to the toilet, she said. There was not a drop of malice or poison in her tone. She was really trying to be nice. He asked us to let him sit in the back, she continued. I think the things you two talked about were very painful for him. He had a hard time holding back his tears. He asked to sit right by the back door. That's why he took all his things with him. We would never have allowed him to take his briefcase and things to the toilet. He was the first person to get off the plane. I was depressed. I started crying. I just couldn't hold it in. The flight attendant, whom I called by all names throughout the flight, hugged me and stroked my back. She made me cry in her uniform. She sat with me while I told the whole story of my relationship with Jared and how I deceived him. She listened as I talked about how he found out and left me, and how, a full year after separation, I still couldn't live without him. It was amazing how the woman I thought hated me turned out to be my best friend when I needed it most. I couldn't remember any of those quotes about the kindness of strangers, but I'm sure they all applied. Finally, when I collected my thoughts, she smiled at me and said that there is always tomorrow. After all, he never said he didn't want to see me anymore. And, at least, now we were talking. I also knew that he still worked at the same place, so I could find him. I realized then that the things we needed to figure out were much more than we could discuss at one time. But I had hoped that someday we could solve them. As I stood up to leave, she smiled at me again and handed me the envelope she was holding. He told me to give this to you, she said. She gave me a letter. It was in an envelope with the airline logo. I looked at him carefully. She turned it over in her hands, as if seeing it from a different angle might change something. Hey, she said as I got off the plane. Merry Christmas, and good luck. Maybe this will be good news. You know how the magic of Christmas works. I smiled back at her and nodded my head. The magic of Christmas was a good thing to think about. Walking past the airport, I saw one of those electronic signs that looked like a scoreboard. They provide all kinds of information about your flight. This sign indicated that my luggage had just arrived at baggage claim for my flight. It looks like the flight arrived on time, but the luggage was delayed while unloading from the plane. I looked at my watch. Only seven minutes had passed since landing. If I hurry, I can still catch up with Jared at baggage claim. I looked at the airport map. I've flown through this airport dozens of times, so I knew where to go. 
I glanced at the map to see which baggage claim I should go to. I ran as fast as I could on my slightly fat legs. When I rounded the last corner, already a little out of breath, I stopped and looked around the large hall. As soon as my eyes approached the exit, I saw him. I saw him as clearly as during the day. I could even see the despair on his face. He grabbed one suitcase from the carousel and turned to the exit. As soon as I took a breath to call him, I saw his expression change. His face at that moment went from very sad to extremely happy. His gaze was fixed on the door. He dropped his suitcase and spread his arms. These were the very arms that I missed so much, wrapping my body in their loving embrace. I realized at that moment that these hands no longer belonged to me and would never belong to me again. She was younger than both of us. She was probably only 26 or 27 years old. She had long, dark hair and that creamy Irish skin with a few freckles. Her long, thin arms and slender but curved legs told me that she usually had a very good physique. Her breasts were huge, but I'm sure that was due to her condition. She was very beautiful, but she didn't seem to care about such things. All this hair was loosely tied on one side with an elastic band. She was also very pregnant. She walked into Jared's arms as if she belonged there. She acted like my Jared was hers. He hugged her as if his life depended on it and gently lifted her off the floor. She tilted her perfect chin up and their lips melted together. He kissed her gently but passionately. She did what women in films did in the 40s. As she kissed him back, one of her legs bent. I let out the air I had inhaled to call him, and it turned into a sad moan. I sank down onto the wall, deciding to wait until they left before picking up my luggage. She snuggled into his side as they walked out the door. You know how airports don't allow curbside parking? Perhaps it was because the baby was pregnant, but they were allowed. She tossed the keys to Jared's Mustang to him, and I watched as they drove away moments after loading his luggage into the car's tiny trunk. I watched the Mustang GT's taillights with their signature three stripes go away, and with them went any hope of making my Christmas wish come true. The lump in my throat was so big that I could hardly breathe. My eyes were wet from the tears I had yet to shed, and I knew this cry would be big. I tried to pull myself together because I really didn't want to fall apart and cry in the airport in front of a bunch of strangers who would use my pain as a talking point. I could imagine them sitting around dinner tables with their families, talking about the crazy old woman who sat in the airport crying over nothing, approaching the baggage claim area. The carousel was still running. There were only two suitcases left on her. One of them was mine. My ankle started to hurt a lot. I arrived at the carousel just as my suitcase was passing by. I tried to grab it and missed, falling to the floor. I heard laughter from somewhere, so I was sure that someone thought my athletic performance was funny. My ankle hurt even more. The suitcases continued to circle in a huge circle, most of which was outside the room, so I had to stand and wait until my suitcase reappeared. When he approached again, I grabbed him and headed towards the parking lot exit. I asked the guy at baggage check when the next shuttle would arrive. He said I had just missed one and would have to wait about 20 minutes for the next one. I wasn't sure I could hold it in for that long, so I decided to walk all the way to the parking lot. Merry Christmas, ma'am, he said cheerfully. His voice sounded just like the one that laughed when I fell trying to get my suitcase. How rude, I replied, making him laugh again. By the time I reached my car, my ankle was throbbing in pain. I threw my suitcase in the back seat and got into the car. I started the engine and turned on the heating and airflow. Sitting in the dark of the car while it warmed up, I finally released all the feelings I'd been holding inside. I cried long and bitterly. I cried not only because the spirit of Christmas had fucking fooled me, but because I had now truly lost the only man I had ever loved. My despair turned to anger after a while. I was angry at the Christmas spirit. I was angry at Jared, and I was angry at this pregnant baby who was so brazenly rubbing herself against him in public. I wiped my face and got ready to go home. Before I put the car into gear, I noticed an envelope from Jared on the seat next to me. I took it and opened it, two pages front and back in Jared's distinctive handwriting. Jared, as usual, got straight to the point. 
He didn't write an introduction, just mentioned my name to make it clear who he was talking to, and moved on to his points. Audrey, I'm sorry to break this to you, but after our conversation, I found myself in too emotional a state to continue. In fact, we didn't even get to finish the conversation, but you told me too many things that took time and distance to process. The first thing you need to understand is that leaving you was the hardest decision of my life. I had no choice because what you did left me broken. I didn't understand what I did to, you stopped loving me, but I knew it had to be a huge mistake for you to go that far. When we broke up, I spent weeks in a cocoon of depression and despair, wondering why you never told me what I was so lacking in that you had to seek solace in the arms of a man old enough to be your grandfather. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't understand my problem. You always seemed happy when we were together and always seemed satisfied when we made love. I started to think that maybe you were just being nice to me or didn't want to hurt my feelings, so I was looking for what you need on the side. For a long time, I didn't even think it was worth trying to find someone else. I always told you that my requirements for a partner are very strict and unique. Look how long it took me to find you. I never thought that I would find the same thing again. I need a special type of woman. I need a woman who looks at me not with her eyes, but with her heart. I was sure that I would spend the rest of my life alone, constantly remembering what I had and what I lost. Imagine my surprise when I met Corinne. The reaction between us was very similar to what it was when I met you. Of course, I was more careful with her after everything that happened between us. But the point is that I really didn't want to spend the rest of my life alone. I'm a person who is only truly happy when I have someone to love. As much as I tried to fight my feelings for Corinne, they only continued to grow. For several weeks, we both realized that we were made for each other. Audrey, Corinne is not your replacement. She's just another chapter in the book of my life. I hope her chapter lasts longer than yours, but it won't be better or worse. Just different. Talking to you today brought back a lot of wonderful memories. I'm sure if we hadn't broken up, we would have grown old together, done everything we dreamed of, and I would have died a very happy man. But it just wasn't meant to be. For a long time, I forced myself not to even think about our time together or how or why it ended. I didn't think for a second that it might not have been my fault. Talking to you today also made me angry because I lost what was the most important thing in my life before we broke up, and it was all in vain. Audrey, if you didn't lie to me today, there was never a reason to do what you did. Remember, when we were together, we talked to many couples who had been married longer than us. They all started out struggling, just like us. In their later years, they always looked back with pleasure on the times when they had to get by without a lot. They always loved to talk about the times when it was just the two of them against the world. Like you said, what you did allowed us to get our house much sooner than we otherwise would have. But it also ended our marriage. Thinking about it now, I'd rather fight a few more years and still be together than have you do what you did and lose you. To be completely honest... The information you gave me today has lifted a huge burden off of my shoulders. Now I won't have to worry about disappointing Corinne the way I thought I disappointed you. I also feel more relieved because, Audrey, you couldn't love me the way I loved you. The whole time we were together, the thought of being with anyone else would make me sick. It obviously didn't affect you, as I now know that the old man with whom I caught you was not the first and not the last. Finally, I'd like to start by answering your original question. On the plane, you asked me, how do you sleep? You told me you've had trouble sleeping since we broke up. Well, Audrey, I haven't been sleeping well either for about a year. At first, it was because I missed you so much. Then it was because I was afraid of failing Corinne the way I thought I had failed you. Lately, it's because sleeping with a very affectionate pregnant woman is terrible. She constantly moves, trying to find a comfortable position, with the weight of her belly pulling her to the side. At the same time, if I move away from her, she finds me and hugs me in her arms, no matter how uncomfortable I am. But other than that, and with the new information you gave me today, I am confident that I will be able to sleep well from now on. No matter how uncomfortable I may be, I will sleep with a woman who loves me and evaluates our life, not by how much money we have, but by the good moments we spend together and how we treat each other. I feel no bitterness towards you, Audrey. 
and if you need closure or forgiveness, it is provided. I sincerely hope that you can move on with your life the way I did. Talking to you has relieved a lot of the guilt over our separation from me because I now realize that it wasn't my fault at all. I also realize that it was all in the past and none of it matters anymore. Merry Christmas, Audrey. He didn't even bother to sign it. I read the letter again and put it back in the envelope and then drove home without incident. I thought about his words all the way. How the hell could I let someone who loved me so much leave? Why was I angry with him? Jared did nothing but go above and beyond for me the entire time we were together. It was my fault that we got divorced. No one else is to blame. As for his new wife, I had no right to be angry with her either. She was smart enough to grab it and appreciate it when I practically threw it away. I walked to the parking lot in front of my small townhouse. I walked to my door and opened it. I was in for another lousy night in front of my lousy TV with my perverted cat. Oh, joy. I hope I haven't run out of tuna. As soon as I walked into the living room, I wondered where my cat was. Maybe, like in It's a Wonderful Life, the point is for me to appreciate what I have more and seriously rethink what I've lost. Perhaps this is a case where, after what I did, there was simply no Christmas wish or Christmas magic left for me. My phone rang, and I answered. It was a kid from the street whom I hired to watch my cat and feed him while I was away. The child cried in tears as he told me about how he opened the door and the cat ran out of the house straight into the street, where he was immediately hit by a passing truck. The truck didn't even slow down. I sat down at the kitchen table and poured myself a very strong drink. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.